I think we see in Joseph Smith a very complex person that in his teen years may have uh, seriously had questions about God, but very soon seems to go in a kind of self-serving direction so that he gets involved in magic and money digging. His father had lost their money through some bad investments and the family was very poor and that may have been part of the motivation for him to get involved in money digging, which was looking for treasures. It was rumored that Captain Kidd, different pirates, had hid treasures up in that area. So the problem for me is not that Joseph was looking for possible buried treasure, it's the means he used to look for them. And so he claimed to find a stone, just a little brown stone, it must have been unusual looking, but that he would place in his hat and kind of like a crystal ball gazer, he would look at this stone and you could pay him to walk over your property, kind of like using a mineral wad, rod to look for water or something. He'd, he could take his stone in his hat and look for buried treasure on your property. So, but, but they never found anything. So the question is, was it a confidence game or are we going to grant that he had some sort of special powers that this stone really worked to tell him where to find treasure. The problem is they never found any treasure. So it looks like it was a confidence game. Well, the problem for the Mormon is that he uses the same stone in his hat to translate the Book of Mormon, which raises the question, is this another confidence game? Has he just moved from one arena to another with this? So when we talk about his character, we have to decide what we're going to make of the money digging first. Um, on what basis do we say he would be a prophet rather than a confidence man? And of course, historically, that's what everyone has to look at the evidence and make their own conclusions. I think, though, that the evidence leads to a negative view of his character when you take it over his whole life, because it isn't just that area of Mormonism. We see him very soon after starting the church being uh, charged with involvement with other women. Now the Mormons will say, well, that was a God-ordained uh, plural marriage doctrine. Except when he's involved with women in the 1830s, there's no revelation on polygamy. There's actually a section in the Doctrine and Covenants that says they don't believe in polygamy at that time. So this also speaks to his character. Was he an adulterer? Or was he a man uh, walking in a command God gave him that was very difficult to marry women behind his wife's back? Then uh, he goes on to marry women that already have husbands that are still alive. Well, this again speaks to character. Is, is this the kind of man that God would be using to start the only true church? I mean, the Mormons say they, that Christianity fell into error soon after the apostles died. Uh, false teaching, corrupt living, and everybody lost their priesthood authority. So when we look at Joseph Smith's life, how do we evaluate him in, in that same kind of a framework? Of, of we look at, we say, oh, original Christianity fell apart. Did Mormonism fall apart? Was his character such that we would believe his claims? He gets to Kirtland in the mid-1830s, sets up a bank, uh, can't get a charter, so they call it an anti-banking establishment. They don't have enough uh, real coin in the bank vault to cover the currency they're issuing, and they know that. So is this a confidence game? Well, if everyone believes your currency and takes it, then uh, it'll, it'll work for a while. But they ran up so much debt that they couldn't possibly pay and honor all of the paper they were issuing. So they had a run on the bank, the whole thing fell apart. Uh, Joseph Smith ends up blaming all the saints for not pulling their weight in the, in the deal. And uh, this seemed to be the way he got out of things. He would get a commandment to do something, it didn't work. And so it wasn't his fault that it didn't work out. It's because you guys didn't do it right, see? So it, it just seems like the God in Mormonism is always playing catch up to what's going on. So whatever Joseph decides to do, if it doesn't work, God comes up with a new plan or says, well, it would have worked if you guys had worked harder. Uh, it just doesn't seem 
like the God I meet in the Bible. Uh, he gets the, the idea that uh, God told him if he lives to 1890, he'll see the return of Christ, but he dies before then. So then I ask a Mormon about, well, what's with that kind of prophecy? And they say, well, he died, and that's why it didn't happen. And I say, well, wait a minute, let's think about this one. Are you meaning God intended Jesus to come back in 1890? But he hadn't factored in that Joseph was going to die in 1844. My God would have known the future enough to know not to tell him you're going to live to 1890 because he would have known when he was going to die. So there are all these kind of problems when you look at Joseph's life. With the integrity aspect of his life in Nauvoo, he not only is lying to the church about his polygamy, he gets minimum 34 wives during his lifetime. That's the modest number. I mean, the Mormon historians concede that number, but others have taken the number even higher than that. Uh, but 11 of these were with women that already had living husbands. Now, how do we reconcile that? That's not covered in the, not even in his revelation. The Revelation 132 in the DNC says, uh, it talks about virgins. If a man has 10 virgins, it doesn't say anything about married women. So he seems to be even going against his own revelation on that one. But he's lying to his wife, he's lying to the church, and he's lying to the city, to the government, to the world, that they aren't living polygamy. He turns around and gets over a hundred of his buddies to go into polygamy with him in secret there in Nauvoo, involving hundreds of women in plural marriage, and yet every statement is that they weren't doing it. Joseph is on record publicly denying polygamy. In fact, the month before he dies, he gives a sermon where he says, what a thing it is to be accused of having seven wives when I can only find one. Well, he probably had 33, 34 of them sitting in the audience at the time of the sermon. So when we speak of Joseph's character, I find a man that is drawn by situation ethics that he doesn't have to always tell the truth. He doesn't have, always have to do the honorable thing. Uh, whatever is most advantageous to him and to his movement is okay, even if it isn't legal. I think when Joseph Smith first starts his money digging, that it probably was a bit of a ego booster and surprise that as a young man, he could get all of these older men in the community to believe him and pay him to walk over their property and look for buried treasure. Uh, I think that encouraged him to set his sights higher. Well, he gets in trouble for his money digging, gets uh, taken to court uh, because people thought he was running a scam. And uh, he tells the judge, well, he's going to stop doing that. He really had a gift to use the stone in his hat, but it hurt his eyes, so he's going to quit doing that. Um, and then when he gets married to Emma, her father objects to Joseph as a son-in-law because he feels he has no regular job. He's just this crazy kid running around with a stone and a hat doing money digging. And so he promises the father-in-law that he's going to give all that up. Well, then the next thing we know, he turns around and he says, oh, well, by the way, God appeared to me, told me about an angel. Uh, an angel told me about this record, Hidden Hill, and it's this religious record. So he seems to have moved from money digging to religion. So he changes his forum for his efforts because he's seeing people will believe him. And he's run out of all the people he can get to hire him to do money digging, so he moves to religion and gets a whole new following. I think he's surprised with his success. The success itself becomes exhilarating and as he has more success, his ideas grow. Uh, he becomes more and more impressed by pomp and ceremony and um, power so that uh, he, he even envisions setting up a political kingdom of God. He secretly has himself ordained king for when the Mormons take over the world. 
he has very, by the end of his life, he has very grandiose ideas. He sets up the Nauvoo Legion. Uh, and in that day, many towns had their own little military because we didn't have the National Guard or things like that in that day. So um, it wasn't unusual to have a local militia, kind of a little standing army. If the government ever had to have a big army, they could call on these guys, and they're sort of like the National Guard. They're already trained. Uh, but he gets... 20, about 2,500 men involved in his little army. I mean, that's huge. There were only like 8,000 guys in the U.S. Army at the time. So 2,500 is a pretty sizable crowd, which is part of the problem in Illinois that people were worried about the Mormons getting too powerful. Uh, but he has himself made lieutenant general of the Nauvoo Legion. There, you have pictures of him in his... Uh, military uniform on his horse with his sword and so I think that as the years went by he found thousands of people that would follow him his ego grew his vision grew to the point of going from a simple little farm boy to seeing himself potentially as being king over the world Mormons today talk of Joseph as the martyr um, and they see him giving his life for the church. They want to equate him with, for instance, Stephen, the martyr in the book of Acts, that is stoned to death for his stand for Christ. But with Joseph Smith, you have a totally different situation. Most Mormons don't even know why he was arrested. Why was he in jail? That, he was killed in jail. Why was he there? Most of them don't know. Well, it's be, all because of polygamy. He had had this secret practice going on in Nauvoo. Two of the young girls that stayed in his home were his uh, legal wards. And one of his own close followers uh, became concerned about whether Joseph was misusing their, the girls' funds and uh, misusing his standing as their guardian in taking them as plural wives. And so you have... Um, charges brought against him on these things. The stories were going all over Nauvoo about his secret polygamy, the secret political kingdom, his new doctrine of uh, plural gods. And many people were opposed to the radical shift Mormonism was taking. And so uh, several of his top leaders set up an opposition newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor that said hey, Joseph Smith's got a lot of secret doctrines here you don't know about. He's got polygamy, he's got this plural gods doctrine, and he has this political kingdom idea. Well, Joseph Smith, as the mayor of Nauvoo, was worried about this kind of blowing the lid off of the insider view of what Mormonism was really about. And as mayor, he orders the destruction of the printing press. That's what ends up eventually being the reason that he's in jail. This is all is stemming from polygamy. So he ends up in jail. All the citizens around Nauvoo are, don't know what to make out of the Mormons. They're scared to death of them. They got the largest militia in the state. Nauvoo at this point was about the size of Chicago. Thousands of people here that all voted as a block for Joseph Smith or anyone Joseph put up as a candidate. So you can see why the people around him would be very concerned with the power of the Mormons in their community. Um, unfortunately, they took the law into their own hands and they stormed the jail and killed him. Now, Joseph was uh, followers have been worried about him being in jail for fear that th something like this would happen. And two guns had been smuggled into the jail. So when the mob attacks the jail, Joseph and his brother Hiram fight back, shooting guns back at the men charging the jail. Well, that puts it outside of the category of saying a martyr's death. For instance, you read the story of Stephen in the book of Acts in the New Testament. Stephen's stoned to death, but Stephen doesn't throw rocks back at the Jews. Joseph is shooting guns back at the mob. Now the Mormons will say to me, well, wouldn't you have tried to protect yourself? And I said, yes. I'm not faulting him for trying to protect himself. I'm faulting the Mormons for calling it a martyr's death.
That's not a martyr's death. So uh, I wish he would have stood trial. If he would, he would have come up on charges of uh, illegal transferring of goods. He had filed for bankruptcy and, and gave property to different people to keep it from being taken. Um, he had the uh, charge of misusing these girls' funds and uh, bigamy charge for uh, having plural wives. Uh, there would have been an indictment on counterfeiting coin that uh, he didn't get listed on because he is dead, but it came out later an indictment from the federal government against Brigham Young and John Taylor and a bunch of the church leaders on counterfeiting. There were uh, many issues that would have come up if he would have been allowed to live and go to court. Uh, by killing him as the non-Mormons did, it gave the Mormons a hero. Uh, it did leave them with a leadership vacuum, and Brigham Young was the most level-headed, sane, one of the top leaders, and stepped in to kind of shepherd the people and help organize them and helped them with the trip across the plains, and he becomes the next president of the church. Um, but Joseph, to, to, tie, to try to say that it was a martyr's death, he wasn't dying for his church. He was dying, it was killed because of things that people felt he had done illegally in the community, and they didn't feel they could get justice before the law. They thought he always seemed to get off by hook or crook. He got off from all the lawsuits, and they were fed up. 